This has been so exciting going over the powerful principles of God's word when it comes to relationships. Now, have I ever got a treat for you? Our very own Living Room Church's very own pastor, Stephanie Martinez. She is going to be our special speaker in this segment, part five. She's calling it family dysfunction. I believe it's going to touch your life. It's going to transform you. I'm just really hoping she tells some stories and maybe, just maybe, she might have a special guest have her husband walk in, our good friend Eloy Martinez. I really believe this is going to be a blessing to your life. Buckle up and get ready. Ladies and gentlemen, Pastor Stephanie Martinez. This series has been packed with wisdom on relationships. In part one, we learned that every relationship, it's taking us somewhere. It's taking us up or down, forward or backward. There's good seed and bad seed. There's good ground and bad ground. And our seed can't ever improve the ground. It can only prove the ground. In part two, we choose our destiny when we choose our relationships. In part three, we learned that in relationships, we are either prodigals or protégés. Prodigals want to take what's in your hand, but they want the stuff independent of the relationship. Protégés want what's in the mentor's heart and put great value on their wisdom. Part four taught us about communication. Communication is more than just words. Communication employs tone, touch, eyes, expression, listening, and don't forget timing. All of those things help us build good relationships. This has been an incredible mini at-home conference. And not to sound like an infomercial, but wait, there's more. Do you know that it is impossible to be in a healthy relationship without faith? Now, I didn't say it's impossible to be in any old relationship or even a good relationship. I said a healthy relationship. Today, in part five of relationships, we're going to talk about taking the dis out of family dysfunction. Do you remember family road trips? You know, the station wagon with the luggage rack or the minivan with the U-Haul trailer behind it? You make it about half hour down the road and somebody needs a snack. The endless, are we there yet, begins. Siblings start fighting and then poking each other. Then it escalates to slapping. Mom or dad gets fed up and says, don't you make me come back there. Not like they could, they're driving. You add in some aunts, uncles, grandmas, grandpas, and cousins twice removed, and you have all sorts of family dysfunction. Jeff Foxworthy, the famous comedian, said, if you ever start feeling like you have the goofiest, craziest, most dysfunctional family in the world, all you have to do is go to a state fair, because five minutes at the fair, you'll be going, you know, we're all right. We are dang near royalty. <laughs> God is the designer of family. It was his idea. He originated it and orchestrated it. For some of you, though, your family ties are more like family knots. Knots or not, all families are unique. Eloy and I are a blended family. When I married Eloy, I gained his two beautiful daughters. And while I never carried them physically, I carry them deeply in my heart. They're mine. Maybe you're part of a blended family, step-parents, step-kids, half-brothers, half-sisters. Maybe your family tree looks more like a family jungle. Perhaps your blended family includes children that you've adopted, or you're a widow or widower that remarried and gained a brand new family. If you're married, you gained your spouse's family. One side might be quiet and reserved, while the other, you can't get a word in because it's so loud and crazy. Or maybe one of you is from a Pennsylvania Dutch background where food is barely seasoned, and you marry into a Mexican family where it's all about savor or flavor. This white girl had to learn that you don't use a packet of Ortega to make your taco meat. You may not all live in the same house, but they're still a part of your life. We all end up blending family in one way or another. 
Do you know that even in the body of Christ, we are a part of a blended family? God's family initially started out with the Jewish people, but in Romans 11, it it uses an agricultural reference about how the Gentiles were grafted in, connected through faith. When we talk about family, we're not just talking about a bloodline, we're talking about a faith line. Galatians 3, 7 says, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Look at that. We're in the family of faith and Abraham is our father. That's because of Jesus. Throughout the writings of the New Testament, you hear the parenting of the Holy Spirit. There was infighting, mistreatment, divides, prejudice, and unfair expectations. There were cultural preferences that turned into coercive pressure. The New Testament is full of corrective and guiding instruction for family, and it's largely summed up in verses like Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Colossians 3.11, here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. When I married Eloy, my life changed. We now share the same address, the same bathroom, and the same last name. I could no longer live like I was single. I had to start living in the reality of my marital relationship. The two became one. My personality didn't change, but some of my practices had to. Things were no longer about who I was. They were more about who I was becoming. I exchanged single life for family life. In the early church, it was no longer about who they were. It was about who they were becoming in Christ in this new relationship. Ephesians chapter 2, 11 describes our before Christ lives with words like separate from Christ, excluded, foreigners, without hope, and without God, essentially on the outside looking in. Have you ever felt that way? But all that changes when we choose Jesus. Verse 13 flips the script and brings in the story of hope. Let's read it together. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one, talking about the Jews and Gentiles, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. We now have access to Father God by what Jesus did on the cross. That's good news. We can choose to be in the family of faith. We don't have to be on the outside looking in. We can be in the vehicle of faith moving forward. When we choose Jesus, we become a part of God's household, his family. Now, we all know that families can be a little quirky, whether we're talking about God's family or our own biological family. It's said that every family has at least one weird relative. If you don't know who that is, It's probably you. (laughs) Consider the first family of faith in the book of Genesis. Abram, later called Abraham and known as the father of faith, lied to two different kings, telling them that his wife Sarah was his sister because he was afraid that they would kill him. 
After waiting a long time to have a child, Abram agreed to his wife's suggestion to sleep with the housekeeper Hagar in order to give them a child. Later, Abram's response to Sarah's complaints when Hagar started mistreating Sarah, do whatever you want with her. And this was the hero of faith talked about in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. So Sarah sent Hagar and her child away. Abram and his nephew Lot and their employees argued over the family business, causing them to part ways. That's when Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom, a place of godlessness which had some serious ramifications in his family line. Lot's unmarried daughters got their dad drunk and slept with him so that they could have children. And we all know what happened to Lot's wife. Imagine that conversation at the family reunion. Where's your wife, Lot? Oh, she's just feeling a little salty right now. Let's talk about Abraham's grandsons, Jacob and Esau. Esau sold his birthright for some food because he was starving. Isaac lied about his wife, Rebecca, telling people that she was his sister. We heard that one before. Rebecca and her son Jacob deceived his dad Isaac into believing that Jacob was his big brother Esau. To secure the deception, this mom actually covered Jacob's arms with goat hair so that his skin would feel like his brother's hairy arms. They tricked Isaac into giving Jacob the blessing instead of the firstborn Esau. When Esau found out, he was furious and consoled himself. He actually comforted himself with the thought of killing his brother. Jacob ran for his life to his uncle Laban's house. There he fell in love with Laban's daughter, Rachel, and worked seven years for her hand in marriage, only to be deceived himself and find that a sister swap was made, and he actually married Rachel's sister, Leah. Leah and Rachel's story of having children reads like a modern-day soap opera full of infighting and jockeying for Jacob's love and attention. Then Joseph comes along, and with him, a big dose of nepotism, clearly his dad's favorite. His brothers plotted to kill him, but then they just settled to sell him into slavery. Now that's some serious sibling rivalry. American businessman and philanthropist Wayne Heisinger says that some family trees bear an enormous crop of nuts. I could go on and on. There's deceit, lying, revenge, jealousy, and murder. And this was the first family of faith. This family put the dis in dysfunction. Maybe you're comforted thinking, at least my family isn't that bad. Or maybe you're thinking, they ain't got nothing on my family. Reading through the accounts of this first family of faith, the dysfunction is undeniable. But do you know what else was undeniable? The promises of God, the faithfulness of God. I see an unwavering faith in Abram, later called Abraham, in spite of his choices. I see the redemption of God written throughout the threads of their story. I see reconciliation where it would seem impossible. I see humility replace arrogance and restore what was completely decimated. I see God's perfection thriving even in the midst of their dysfunction. There's hope. There's hope. Whether we're talking about God's family by choice or the family that we're born into, there's always a level of dysfunction. Mary Carr, an American poet and writer, says, a dysfunctional family is a family with more than one person in it. So what do we do with the dysfunction? Or better yet, what does he do with dysfunction? Here's the amazing thing about God. He partners with us to take the dis out of family dysfunction. Like Pastor Stephen has been telling us, every relationship is taking us up or down, forward or backward. Here are five things that will help to take the dis out of family dysfunction. Hey, remember, take some time this week. Get together with a few trusted friends. Talk about these points. Find out where it applies in your relationships today. Here they are. Five things that will take the dis out of family dysfunction. Number one, order. Number two, forgiveness. Number three, boundaries. 
Number four, trust. And number five, transformation. Let's unpack this a little bit. Number one, order. Ephesians 2.20 talks about Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation. Psalm 127.1, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Abraham tried to build his own house and it was disastrous. In a vehicle, you can't have more than one driver. I learned this the hard way. When I was a young teenager, my cousin Shane and I got to drive his dad's golf cart. We both wanted to drive, but settled on a compromise to share the driving responsibilities. I would work the gas pedal and he would steer. I gunned it as fast as the golf cart would go. Then Shane decided to take a sharp turn. My top speed and his sharp turn made for a really bad combination. I flew out of the moving golf cart and have the scar on my knee to prove that having multiple drivers does not work. He's the driver. He's the builder. He's the foundation of our families. That's where order begins. Number two, forgiveness. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as Christ forgave you. We don't forgive because it's easy. We forgive because we've been forgiven. Let's be clear, forgiveness doesn't condone the actions of another. It releases them from their debt, which in turn keeps you debt free. You might ask, how many times do I forgive? I might ask you the question, how many times have you been forgiven? Understand forgiveness doesn't mean that you stay in harm's way or allow for continual abuse and mistreatment. That's where the wisdom of number three is applied, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Even if you have to forgive from a distance, forgive. And we can't just forgive others. We have to forgive ourselves. You can't go on blaming yourself and living out of a place of guilt and shame. That's a dead end. But Jesus came to take that shame. Give it to him. He knows how to take the dis out of our dysfunction. Number three, boundaries. Boundaries protect and direct. Family doesn't mean free for all. When we drive, we're governed by the laws of the road. We follow the lines on the road. They direct. Whether they are our double yellow lines, it means it's not safe to pass. They protect. Ships have channel markers to keep them from running aground. Planes have radar to keep there from being catastrophic collisions in the air. Boundaries are necessary. What boundaries are you setting? This isn't about subjective morality. These boundaries are built on a biblical construct, His truth, His way. What boundaries do you have in place that will help protect and direct your family? Not everyone is going to agree with our boundaries. They might be unpopular and certainly not fit into a woke culture. When people around you don't agree with your boundaries, it doesn't mean that you kick them to the curb and disown them. No. You follow his word in Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do your part, but you can't do it all. There are times when you have to choose to go up and choose to go forward, even if others don't come with you. Boundaries protect and direct. Number four, trust. Trust what? Trust that he is working. A lot of wrong things can happen in a family, but God can work even through the wrong. Romans 8.28 says that God is able to make all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That doesn't mean that everything is good, but that he can make it all work together for good. It was more than 13 years between the time Joseph was sold into slavery and this exchange with his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. God was working the whole time. He was working in Joseph and he was working in his brothers. 
God will work in you and he will work in your family. Maybe you've gotten off the highway of believing and trusting God. Maybe you've taken a detour. Hear the rerouting call of the Holy Spirit. Take the on-ramp and get back on the highway. Know that God is working in your family and in your situation, even if it's not evident. Number five, transformation. God is an expert at transformation. In Isaiah 61, it tells us that he can bind up the brokenhearted, comfort all who mourn, give a crown of beauty instead of ashes, and the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of despair. God can bring transformation even out of devastation. Consider a forest fire. Whenever most people see a forest fire, they automatically think about all the trees and bushes that are being destroyed. After the fire is over, the landscape looks like a blackened scene of desolation. But some plants and trees actually need fires in order to survive. A number of plants rely on fire to release their seeds, eliminate competition, or supply a rich layer of nutrient-filled ash. Their cones referred to as serotonous, which means late blooming or opening. These cones can hang on a pine tree for years without opening up to release its seeds. Perhaps one of the most famous trees that have serotonous cones is the giant redwood or sequoia of California. Towering up to nearly 300 feet tall and 50 feet in diameter, the giant sequoia are the world's largest trees in total volume. Their cones can contain up to 200 seeds and may take just under two years to mature. Once matured, they will remain in the cone and await a forest fire. The heat from the fire causes the cones to open and release their seeds. Along the coasts of California, a number of plants rely on fires, but in different ways. Some plants, like mule's ear and iris, store most of their energy in their roots and underground bulbs. When a fire sweeps past and wipes out everything above the ground, these plants respond to the heat and ash that is rich with nutrients and can be the first plants to sprout back up into the barren landscape. Many forests rely on periodic fires just to clean them up, getting rid of old and diseased plants and trees, and clearing the way for new life. God is an expert at transformation even out of the things that look desolated. The outcome of Israel turning back to God in Hosea 2.15 was that he would make the valley of Achor, which means trouble, a door of hope. He can turn trouble into a doorway of hope and take the dis out of dysfunction. Eli and I have seen this firsthand, and I'm going to ask him to come and share some of our story. You're absolutely correct, Steph. The Lord can turn trouble or dysfunction in one's life into a door of hope, and He did that for me. About 13 years ago, I found myself in a broken marriage, and it was a time where loneliness had really set in. It was also a time when it didn't seem that redemption was even possible for me. I had failed as a husband, as a father, as a man. It wasn't until I really sought the Lord that He reminded me just how much He loved me and how much that he had planned yet for me. And in those times, I would surround myself with godly counsel, I'd get in his word and in his presence. And yeah, that's where I found peace, in his presence. And after I made the decision to recognize and believe that I didn't have to accept the lies of the enemy, it's like a layer just was ripped off. I felt, well, I was able to see hope again in my future. And I began to write down the things that I wanted in a wife and a partner in that significant relationship. As I continued to seek God, worship Him, I began to write those things down and speak them out. And it wasn't too long after that that I was asked to help with a mom-teen-daughter conference where my involvement would serve as a support to the conference's guest worship leader. It was an honor just to be involved, so I was happy to take a back seat. We worked really hard to get everything set up, and we wanted to serve with excellence. I didn't know who this worship leader was, but the day came, and wouldn't you know it, the person who walked out on stage, you got it, Stephanie. 
My whole life changed with a gift from God in what seems like a moment of time. It was like a thousand answers to prayer in one. And some say I kept smiling the entire night. What I thought was just another story of serving clearly became my story of redemption and the rest became our history. God is still writing our redemption story. March 17, 2012 changed both of our lives. Eloy's been an incredible gift to me. He makes me laugh. <laughs> he knows how to navigate me. And of course, there's nothing like leading worship with him. God's still taking the diss out of our dysfunction. He's helping us blend a family with two beautiful daughters and our son, Josiah. Maybe you can relate to our story. Some of you feel like you failed, like you've left a trail of dysfunction. Maybe you think that there's no way he could make something beautiful out of the mess that you or someone else has created, but he can. Loneliness doesn't have to be the end of your story. Psalm 68.6 says that God sets the lonely in families. He knows how to take the diss out of our dysfunction. He knows how to turn trouble into a door of hope that leads into a brand new life. And he wants to do this in you. Let him take the diss out of your family dysfunction. Choose Jesus and be a part of God's family. Pray this along with us. Heavenly Father, I give myself to you. I give you my loneliness and failure. I give you my trouble and I ask you to fix what's broken. Be first in my life. Be first in my relationships. Help me to forgive and receive forgiveness. Help me to trust you and know that you are working all things together for my good. Thank you for transforming my life and making me brand new. Help me to follow your truth in all of my relationships from this moment on. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's Word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.